Well, I would begin by thanking you for calling me to be your associate pastor and celebrating me in such fine style last Sunday. It is a humbling thing, I assure you, to be loved by so many. Um, it's hard to know what to say or do. It's overwhelming almost, so thank you. Uh, greater love hath no congregation than one that showers their pastor with tacos and beans and rice and beer. <laughs> thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving my family. And hear me when I tell you I love you with all my heart. Today we begin a new series on the Lord's Prayer. And I figure it's only fitting that we begin with the Lord's Prayer. So if you have it memorized, if you know it by heart, feel free to join me as I pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes. Do you see that? That's a really good showing, guys. Think about it. No words. And you know it. You have it right here. Why is that? It's part of your inheritance. Many of you guys can't remember a day in your lives that you didn't know it. That means that God is at work in his kingdom in a beautiful way. We'll talk more about it in a minute. As you know, I'm a bivocational minister. I work here for you. I'm so glad that I work here for you. And I'm also a librarian. I like that too, but I mean, if you have to pick, definitely this one. As a librarian, I assure you, I have met so many interesting people. Interesting people. And in fact, of all of the weird, crazy, strange people out there, the one thing they may have in common is that at one point in their lives, they frequent a library, okay? Somehow they always end up in the library, which I love. Uh, one time while I was working at a university, I met this wild-eyed guy, and he did. He looked like wild eyes. He was sitting in the reference section, and he was looking at old maps, these big topographical maps, and I keep saying this word, I assume people know. The topographical maps are the ones with the, like the swirly circles all over them because they're the maps that are trying to show you the height of something, right? Like especially mountains. So this guy is looking at these really, really mysterious looking big topographical maps of the southwest, okay? Now this is rare stuff that you will not find on the internet. Believe it or not, there's still stuff out there that's not on the internet, okay? And this guy's looking at these maps, and I kid you not that he's looking with a magnifying glass at these maps, okay? Very curious. And every time I approached him to greet him, to offer to help him, which is what you're trained to do when you're a librarian, I go to him, and every time I do this, he goes like this. <laughs> he covers over his maps like they're the answers on a test in school or something. It's really crazy that he did this. It's very strange. I saw him do this every night for a week or so at this university library, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, he was gone. And I never saw him, you know, or I, did, I thought I wasn't ever going to see him again. And I was left to wonder, is he okay? I wondered if anything had happened to him, and then sure enough, a few weeks later, I saw him again. And guess what? He was back at the maps. This was his routine. He would pour over these really rare topographical maps for a few days at a time, and then he would be gone for weeks at a time, only to return to his maps. It made no sense, just like you guys are thinking. This makes no sense. It made no sense till I found out what he was doing. Would you like to know what he was doing? It turned out that he had figured out a way to use old topographical maps to locate silver deposits in the Southwest. Seriously, this is real. This is a true story. He would come in and scour the map collection, and then he would go out and dig. And once he exhausted his lead, he would come back to the maps to find more deposits to go out and dig. 
And it made sense when I found out because he was the best dressed crazy person I've ever seen. (laughs) Now, what would you say if I told you this guy never left to dig for treasure? What would you say if I told you he figured out how to read the maps and find the silver, but he never left the library? What would you say if I told you that he left his treasure buried, choosing instead to stay in the library and read maps all day? What would you say? The reason I ask is because this is exactly what we do when we don't pray. According to Calvin, the Father opens up the treasures of heaven to us in Christ that we might seek his treasures through prayer. God invites us to pray, to freely present our requests in Christ that we might have our every need fulfilled in him, that we might become what we've learned to be in him. I love that phrase from Calvin, that we might become what we've learned to be in him. So what would it be like for us to not pray? Calvin tells us it would be like a man who knew about a treasure but left it buried. It would be like a man sitting in the library reading treasure maps all day long. That's what it's like. When we don't pray, we reject the blessings that are ours in Christ. To misquote the psalmist that you heard a minute ago, We would forget all his benefits. When we don't pray, we forget that he forgives all our iniquities. When we don't pray, we forget that he heals all our diseases. When we don't pray, we forget that he redeems our lives from the pit. When we don't pray, we forget that he crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. When we don't pray, we forget that he satisfies us with good. And when we don't pray, Our youth runs through our fingers. When we don't pray, we fail to become what we've learned to be in Christ. For in Christ, we have learned to become children of God. In Christ, we've learned to call God Father. And there's a lot of things that Christ did in his day that were completely unique to him. But one of the most notable is that he taught us to call His Father, our Father. Remember what Paul says in Romans. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So what have we learned to be in Christ? In Christ we have learned to become children of God, just like he is a child of God. But how can we become children of God if we don't pray? How can we become children of God if we don't pray? Again, it's like Paul says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by who we cry, Abba, Father. How can we be children of God if we don't cry, Abba, Father? For when we don't pray, we make ourselves like orphans again. Spiritual orphans, a slave, slaved, enslaved, alone and at risk. Do you feel enslaved? Do you feel alone? Do you feel at risk? Do you pray? Once upon a time, I thought I was a man of prayer. I thought I was a man of prayer until I met a man of prayer. And then I didn't realize that, and then I I realized that I wasn't what I thought I was. And I dare say most of us are not people of prayer. And why is that? Because prayer takes time and we don't have time for God. Prayer takes focus 
and our focus is needed elsewhere. Prayer takes faith, and our faith has been shaken by any variety of things. Prayer takes time. Prayer takes patience. Yes, even patience. And we have no patience left. It's all used up. We don't have patience even for God. We may not be a people of prayer, but I'm here to tell you this morning that we can learn to be. We can learn to be people of prayer this day. To make time for our Father, to focus on our Father, to believe in our Father again, to learn to wait on our Father the way the psalmist says. We can learn to be a people of prayer, namely by following Jesus as he prays. Because that's exactly how the disciples learned how to pray, by following him as he prayed. I want you to listen to this litany of scenes. Because they get lost when we read the Gospel of Luke all together. There are many times that Jesus prays. I want to tell you about them all, very briefly. And together we can follow him. The day he was baptized, he called out. Perhaps he called out, Father who art in heaven. The text tells us he prayed. And what happened? The Holy Spirit descended upon him and the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. While in one of the cities, Jesus healed a man of leprosy. And when the crowd seek to glorify Jesus, he withdrew and he went out to a desolate place to pray to his Father, to glorify his Father. Perhaps he said, hallowed be thy name. On the Sabbath, Jesus enters the synagogues to teach. And as he teaches, he heals a man with a withered hand. And when the authorities got angry at him, Jesus ran out of the city. And he goes to the mountain to pray. It says night and day for days. Maybe he was worried and cried out to his father. Maybe he prayed, deliver me from evil. Then the disciples come to him while he's praying. Perhaps he was praying, your kingdom come. And Jesus asked them, what do the crowd say that I am? Who do they say I am? Some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah, but what does Peter say? With kingdom words, he says, you are Christ, the son of God. Eight days later, Luke tells us that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain to pray. Perhaps on earth as it is in heaven. And his face changes and he becomes radiant as day. And Moses and Elijah appear before them. And a voice comes from on high saying, this is my beloved son. And the night before his death, what did he do? He goes out on the Mount of Olives to pray. He tells his disciples to pray. Basically, he says this. Lead us not into temptation. And then he goes further into the garden and he prays, Father, thy will be done. So can you see his whole life in a very real way? It's the Lord's prayer. All throughout Luke, we find Jesus taking time and finding places and finding words to pray to his Father to be a child of God before his father. For this is exactly what prayer is really about. Prayer isn't really about being righteous. It isn't about being religious. It's not about getting the answers you want. It's not about me getting the answers that I want. Prayer is about being a child of God just like Jesus. That's what it's about. For it's through prayer that we become more and more the children of God. But how does it work? How does prayer make us more and more into the children of God? Well, it does it in a lot of ways, and here are just a few. Prayer gives us something to do while our big brother is away. Prayer helps us to wake up and stay awake. Prayer helps us to keep our hearts burning like lamps in the night. Prayer gives us the opportunity to heed the spirit of Christ in us who lives and breathes in us and convinces us of our inheritance in him. 
And the Spirit, as we pray, it groans in us and it goads us to flee that former slave master and to run to our Heavenly Father. Prayer gives us access to our Father's throne room. And when we pray, the Spirit lifts our voices on high and we appeal to our Father's promises and love. Prayer teaches us that our Father's word is true. For when he answers our prayers, he teaches us in our heart of hearts to trust him more and more. Prayer gives us a way to rely more and more on him for our every need. And as we rely on him, we honor him over our idols. And prayer gives us a chance to delight in God and for God to delight in us because there is nothing more that the Father delights in than hearing us bring our every need to his feet. He is, after all, a father. But being children of God means praying for more than our things. Children of God, being children of God means praying for the things of God. Being children of God means praying to our heavenly father, praying that his name be glorified, praying that his kingdom come, praying that his will be done on earth as is in heaven, praying for bread that the world knows not of, praying for the grace to forgive and be forgiven, praying to flee temptation and to be delivered from evil. Why? For his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In other words, being children of God means joining the rest of our family in prayer. And that's what we do when we pray the Lord's Prayer. We join our voices with one another. And we don't even have to have the words in front of us to do it. And guess what? It's not just us praying it together. It's the churches down the road too. It's the churches in India. It's the churches in Africa. Praying the same words with us. Because it's for us, it's our family prayer. When we pray it, we join our voices with those brothers and sisters near and far. And in joining our voices, we become one on earth as it is in heaven. And so the Lord's Prayer is a family prayer, prayed by the family for the family. When we pray it, we join in the family business. We join in the family business, and the family business is kingdom. Kingdom. Always kingdom. Kingdom first. Everything else second. And over time, the prayer changes us. We find ourselves more and more willing to see his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And I will tell you, as I prepared this sermon, I've never prayed the Lord's Prayer more in my life. And it's true. It does something. They're not just words. They go somewhere. They land somewhere. And let me tell you, he does something with them. And this is exactly what the world needs, by the way. More of his will done here like it is up there. Not our ideal president. Not our ideal economy. Not our ideal culture. What this world needs is his will down here like it is up there in every age. The disciples see Jesus praying and they ask him, Jesus, teach us to pray. And he teaches them, but he teaches them so much more than just to pray. He teaches them to pray to his father. He teaches them to pray to his father because he doesn't want them wandering alone like orphans. He doesn't want them returning to their old master like slaves. He teaches them to pray to his father just like him, that they might become a people of prayer just like him, that they might be children of God just like him, that they might join in the family business just like him, that they might cry out for the heavenly treasures, that all things might be added to them for the sake of his kingdom. And even now, 
The son prays for his kingdom at the right hand of the father up there. That the children of God down here might have what they need. That the treasures that we seek in him would be poured out on us for the sake of his kingdom. Even now he prays this and he calls us to join him. He teaches us to pray just like he taught the disciples so long ago. And as he teaches us, he reassures us the same way that he reassured them in his day. He reassured them with the love of the Father, and he reassures us the same way. So hear these words, because they're for you just as much as they were for the disciples back then. Fear not, little children, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not be anxious. Seek first the kingdom. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find... Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks of the Father receives. And the one who seeks will find him. And the one who knocks will find that the Father's door is always open. Amen. Let us go to him in prayer. O Lord, teach us to pray as the children we are in Christ, not as slaves or as orphans, but as children of God. Teach us by the word and spirit of your Son to be people of prayer. Change us that we, might, that we might take up the family business, that we might seek the kingdom first, that we might seek and find every good thing, every heavenly treasure in Christ our big brother. In his name we pray, amen.